Hello, Professor Bright here. Welcome back to the Sunless Sea, where I made a bit of a mistake last episode. See, I went down to the library, and I didn't get paid for going down to the library, which is all sorts of upsetting. So we're going back in. And we're going to be at the stage of history. And where are the people who want to pay me? There we are. Deliver a portrait of a time past. Throw details on manners, opinions, laws, and the people they shaped. A comedy of errors and accounting. Life moved by the forces surrounding the individual. The pomposity of the great, the spirit of the many made manifest. Clearly the perfect material for a musical. The drowny chorus agrees. If you say so. But I will take that 300 echoes. Very nice, very nice. Hmm. I could spend 50 of it. Let's watch a dramatic reenactment. The drowny chorus presents a sweeping historical opera with a two-drink minimum. A surprisingly brisk epic. A city rises and falls in a matter of hours, with cast members playing a dozen roles each over the years. The dance number at the end is a crowd pleaser. Afterwards, the drowning king assures the crowd that the dancing was strictly allegorical. Hmm. Perhaps risque? Dancing? Hmm. Oh. And then I could have these guys... Huh, I see how we do this. So basically I'm going to play both of these guys against each other. Sort of like what the glib historian's doing, only with me going into the archives. I see how this story goes, but uh, yeah, let's leave just now. And uh, oh. Wait, this is 5Z stories? Oh, that's more than I want to be spending. Um, yeah, I guess we'll lose another hunting trophy. They aren't that useful to me right now. And, with that little bit of business taken care of, let's go. I'm debating, though. Do I want to go back? I kind of do. But by the same token, if I go east, there's more... I didn't realize that was a rock for me to hit. Anyway, if I go further east, there's more for me to discover, not least of which will be the Shellinate. And possibly the Gant Pole? I took a look at the achievements, and, uh, well... A few of the things, I'm pretty sure I know where they are. What's that? The dragon in the Z. Again. You know, I don't know if you guys are seeing my achievements, actually, now I'm thinking about it. But also... Uh, oh, wow, you're, like, right there, and oh, wow. Oh. Uh, can we discuss this? The Edge of Nook. A gap in this colossal Z monster's throat has been forced open with thick heart metal beams. That seems like a stupid idea. How do you think this is going to end for you guys? Oh well. They strain under the pressure, but hold. As you pass through, your submarine lights pass over a message carved in a floating piece of some unfortunate's hull. Beyond is Nook. Beyond is freedom. Beyond is... The rest is scratched out. Enter Nook. Water presses against the airlock door. The breathing and slithering of the beast gives it the rhythm of a drum beat. Cool. Trespasser in freedom. You don your heavy diving suit and give the order to cycle the airlock. Water rushes in and you begin the slow swim down into the port. Soon becomes obvious that you are overdressed for the occasion. The people of Nook swim and breathe in the cloudy maw water with no apparent discomfort. Most are naked with just a few clad in rotten rags that stream from their skin with no concern for modesty. None will communicate with you, if they even can. Those who acknowledge your presence just laugh silently at your bulky suit and unnecessary air hose. You'll need a different approach. What? Descend naked into Nook. This seems like a terrible idea. What? Ah, the effects of prolonged stays in Nook can be... Reduced in Igol, where memories are sacrificed. Interesting. How are these people breathing? Oh, well, I guess we'll descend naked into Nook. At least you're unlikely to run into anyone you know. You undress. Every button, every stitch. The door opens. Ice-cold water rushes upwards. Instinct holds your mouth shut. Ten seconds. Twenty seconds. Your lungs burn, holding in that last gulp of air. 
Your legs thrash. You can't hold it in. It escapes. You're choking on water. It forces its way into your lungs. The taste of burning salt suffocating every attempt to gasp, scream, or... Then, through the exhaustion and panic, you realize you're breathing. It's hard work. Your lungs fight against the weight, but it's enough. You can tolerate it, at least for now. The liberal application of wine will make this process easier, if you say so. In the future, bring a cask. Huh. I mean... What is this thing and why is it here? The ruptured throat. A torn, pinned-back cavity in the flesh wall offers access to the city's monstrous host. Razor-sharp teeth the size of buildings jut from fatty, garnet-red flesh. Many teeth have been quarried out into homes, barricaded by scraps of wood from shipwrecks. Could swim upwards to the Great Maw. But the more you do a nook, the more nook will change you. Interesting. We're going to compile our port report first. No one here has anything to hide. Actually, no one here is hiding anything at all. <laughs> Notes on Nook. A vile place, festering, acidic. No laws but those of tooth and claw written in scars. Civilization? Impossible. Making tea would be a logistic impossibility. Yet the inhabitants seem content. Many have come here from London, the Connate, the Presbyterate, abandoning cultured life for this tenuous existence. They grin, their mouths full of stolen flesh, or float naked and carefree. Many have nothing and nothing to lose. A group of swimmers dart past, hunting gleefully. One squeezes your shoulder, companionably. You've never... you've never met her before. Okay. I mean, swim upwards to the Great Moor, I'm... curious. A twitching cathedral of ivory flesh and decay, the maw curves far enough to be swallowed by the darkness of the Z. Entire shipwrecks have been mulched between hooked teeth that dwarf London's mightiest monuments. Gaze up through the maw. Not many sailors have seen the Z from this angle. Crunching, writhing beauty. Light glitters where the false stars shine on the surface of the Z, framed by the maw's dormant teeth. How ancient is this creature? What happens if it swallows? Hmm. Taste of freedom. And we're gaining terror. You know what? Let me check. I think I'm losing this tolerance for nook water every time I do something, and I hope that's not the case. Because this might end very badly for us if that is. Well, let's find out. Investigate an etched tooth house. A flinty latitudinarian? Latitudinarian? There we go. Keeps its upper cavities filled with compressed air allowing a number of activities otherwise impossible in watery nook. The external surface of the tooth is covered with engravings, rows of battling soldiers, some with the heads of dogs, a mountain ablaze, ships riding on a river, and each ship has a human mouth. You swim inside and up to chambers of eggy air. Hey! I like the look of you. The flinty latitudinarian. There we go. In the cavities of his etched tooth home, trapped air pockets allow an activity largely forsaken in nook, conversation. A handful of nook folk gather there to reminisce. Brevity is admired, the air is precious and rapidly fouls. Latitudinarian watches and listens. He keeps a merciless peace within his house and cares not a damn for what happens outside it. Ah, if only I had recent news. Oh well, back into the nook water, back out to the great throat. Yeah, I guess we'll swim back down. Yeah, let's mingle. And I've lost all tolerance for nook water. That's probably a bad idea. Lost in freedom, they acknowledge your presence, but little more. Most shrink back, assuming you mean harm. Others deliberately swim just above you in a crude attempt at intimidation. They carry bone knives or tooth-tipped spears. A few gesture to you in welcome, invitation, it's unclear. The slightly glutinous, glutinous water makes speech impossible. So the natives have developed a language of signs. You can interpret the most basic of finger pulled across the throat, for example, as one of the more polite invitations to depart. Time to leave. Your lungs, unaccustomed to breathing water, are beginning to labor. You must return to your ship. Old habits there. The bright light of your submarine's main beam. The airlock. Home. 
You swim into the airlock and alert the crew. Air flows in. You retch the last of the nook water from your lungs. Return to the crew. Air again. How refreshing. Good. All is well. Anything that happened in Nook shall remain in Nook. Huh. That's very bizarre. One that they've somehow managed to entrap a creature here? Because I can't imagine that... Yeah, I cannot imagine that it just likes being... Having its mouth forced open and having people swim all around it. That just seems weird to me. Alright, we're gonna- oh! That one was a trap. Well. I mean, I should have seen that coming, let's be honest, but... Oh well. <laughs> I mean, one of them I was able to salvage stuff from, so I kind of assumed that all of them were safe. Clearly, not the case. Oh, and I think I found another port right here. Unless I'm much mistaken. Rise. Which one, though? Hmm, Godfall, perhaps? Oh, Nuncio! Oh, my favorite. Yay. Love the post office. Oh, dear. Well, it's not really the post office. It's complex. Anyway, do not return, sender. Taciturn functionaries walk the docks in the uniforms of postmen. An enormous crown statue casts a chilling shadow. The shadows gleam with rat's eyes. Their ceaseless chittering rolls like the tide. Assemble our port report. There's the statue in the middle of the island that's hard to miss. There's the way everyone wears a uniform and the way they call each other by their ranks in the postal service. There's the way the port authorities refer to regulations. And there's the jargon, the curious habit of referring to any used up thing as cancelled, as though the whole world were made of stamps. You write about vestigial bureaucracy and about trappings of order retained far from home. And, of course, we're going to go to the tavern, the inky blotter, it's called. Sign doesn't look like much. Faces turn in your direction, but no one seems surprised to have a new arrival on the island. Hmm. Nothing new, though. Lit by two roaring fires, one at either end of the room, the bartender is in postman's uniform, like almost all the patrons. A noseless postal inspector called Blunt Thomas delivers the drinks, clears tables, stacks the firewood. We listen in on their tall tales. Fishermen brag about fish that got away, postmen brag about hard deliveries. It's amazing what you get for a penny stamp. Delicate bottles lowered down chimneys on a rope. Do not fold under any circumstance. Letters curled through a narrow slot. Rattling, groaning crates brought back to the same address every day for 22 days running. The windows they pried open, the servants they bribed, the delivery surcharges they paid out of their own salaries just to get rid of one more packet. It's hard to tell which they hate more, the senders of mail or the recipients. Stands to reason if the message was a welcome one. They'd tell the other fellow in person, reflects the hairless postwoman. And why the local currency consists of rats? That's actually a very fair question. Seeing as, I mean, rats are sentient. Eh. Not sure why that's the case. Anyway, two strings of rats for a pint of ale, three strings for wine, five for the tolerable brandy under the bar. A scarcity is not an issue. The hairless postwoman at the end of the bar smiles mirthlessly. Or maybe it's just the lack of eyebrows that does it. Long enough carrying the things around, you get into the habit, she says. Then she tells you if you stay out late enough, you'll see some of the postmen making a procession to the center of the island, stringing up rats around the statue like yuletide decorations, in prayer to an ancient deity of the place. From the coughing and choking elsewhere in the pub, you'd guess this is a story they often tell to newcomers. Cute indeed. I won't ask why she's hairless. It's a bit, uh, in poor taste, shall we say? But, uh, what about this big statue in the center of the island? If there were a guidebook for visitors, it'd have to be the first entry. The Monumental Postman. Oh, that? That's all of us, isn't it? Sort of the spirit of the island. And oh, how true that must be. Most of them don't seem troubled for more of an explanation than that. Though the hairless postwoman tells you it didn't always look like a fallen London postman at all. They used to have a different face and a more old-fashioned outfit. Hmm. More to you than meets the eye, I would say. Ask how they all occupy themselves all day. There must be more than this. Dead letter office. Big building, center of town, hard to miss. You can work there too if you want. It's not clear whether this is a generous offer or a threat. And we could ask to borrow a uniform. If you're to fit in here, you'll need one. 
They're polite, even apologetic, about your request. You're welcome here, and welcome to take shifts at the dead letter office, but you cannot wear the uniform unless you are a postal employee back in fallen London. Regulations. Blunt Thomas lets you have a look at his uniform jacket, at least. Neat stitching, gilded buttons, a thin but dignified circle of braid at the collar. Inside, a patch that goes over the heart, stitched with six red letters. You can't read it, but it makes your eyes itch and your scalp feel like burning. That's because those are six letters of the correspondence, which is a sort of, um... It's not exactly clear what it is, but basically they're words that if you read, they have, um... What's the term people use? They're a mimetic hazard. There we are. Mimetic hazards. That is what they are. Cause your hair to catch fire if you read them. And other fun effects. Let's try a shift at the dead letter office. There's a sign of a cancelled stamp over the door. An extensive tour, Blunt Thomas takes you around the office, a small collection room where those retrieving letters may state their business. A much larger set of back offices where newly arrived letters and parcels are collected and sorted. A dark, briny smell that never goes away, presumably because so many of the parcels spent time in the water before they arrived here. In the back room is a machine manned, or ratted, by a postal rat, a ratus faber in a pinstriped hat. It shovels sludge damp letters into the machine's hopper, and they come out dried, cleaned, pressed, and sorted into slots by size and quality of paper. One has various possible occupations here, and none could be described as fast-paced. Me, I'm going to offer employment to the postal rat's niece. He asks it as a favor, and she sounds well-trained and eager. The postal rat is grateful, and says so at length, and in a variety of ways. Only so much work to go around on Nuncio. She keeps asking to assist me here, but as you can see, a gesture at heaps of loose gears and unhooked chains, I hardly require any assistance, and my research is at so delicate a stage. But she's an excellent worker, very bright, like her mother. Oh, if you say so. And, uh, yeah, some more shift work so we can actually do some work. Seems to be the chief occupation hereabouts. The fellow man in collections looks awake for half a second when you come in, until he realizes you're here to relieve him. So, I could just ask you for a key to the basements already. Fair enough. There are doors in the dead letter office that you've never seen opened. Surely you can be trusted. Surely. No trouble at all, he's surprised by the request. Most postmen don't like it down there. No one ever asks for a key. We'll cut you a new one. Just be careful in there. And come out if you start to feel wrong. I mean, we have to open the back rooms, of course. The key is warm in your pocket, deep and deeper. You'd expected a few shelves of supplies, more files for letters, a few years older. No, it's a pit, so deep that lantern light does not show the bottom. A spiral walkway descends along its wall, and that spiral opens wider as it goes, as if you were looking through the narrow end of a very large shell. Lining this wall are shelves and nooks, unevenly sized, some are a few inches square and contain single scrolls of papyrus. Others support crates bigger than coffins. They're made of a woody fungus grown to meet requirements. There are no marks of carpentry or any of the postal rat's handiwork. Three turns down the spiral and you feel you can't breathe. Time to leave. You can come back later, maybe. And of course, we're going to come back right away. Oh, no. Let's tell the postal rat about our basement findings. It gives you something new to chat about. He's troubled, but not surprised. They say that's been there since before we came, before there were Londoners in the Neath, before there was a dead letter office. There was something else. And they built the first layer on top of what was there before, and so on. When you press him a little further, he says, I've been down there. Didn't like it much. But I wanted to test my machine. Thought if it could handle some of the very old dead letters, that'd be a good sign, you know. Evidence the machine was in working order. Good, strong sorting categories and so forth. He pauses. There's letters down there that set your hair on fire if you so much as look at them. See the bald patch on my leg? It was a machine accident. Oh no. That singed right off as soon as I put my nose into one of them letters. Hmm. Extraordinary implications. Very valuable. I uh, Fortunately, I can't really descend to the basement with flame. But I could. Just with the mirrors. And it's got a... Even chance, so why not? Arrange contraptions. Divert light. Illuminate what has been dark a long time. Your contraption of fires and mirrors is clever, but insufficient. By the twelfth spiral, you're walking in darkness, and there's no knowing what might be waiting for you down below. We'll give it one more shot. Just the one. 
Hmm, yeah, that'll be it. Gets our terror a bit too high. I think we will... Uh, don't really want to, but I think we're going to have to go back to London. Turn some of this stuff in and go from there. For now, though, thank you for your time. Note the like, comment, and subscribe buttons below. Use them responsibly, and I shall see you all soon.